Well, welcome to the second video in our Ezra series. If you are new to this channel, then I do encourage you to um, click subscribe so that you'll get notifications every time I post a new video. This section, Ezra 3, I've called Worship by the Book. As we'll see, God's returned people seeking to live in accordance with what he's written and to worship him rightly together in accordance with he, what he has written. Um, as always, just take some time to read through this chapter, familiarize yourself with what's going on, note down repetition that you see or in interesting ideas. And as always, I'm going to highlight what I've seen in this section. Um, just take some time also to pray and ask God to help you to grow to know him better through his word. That as you have a right knowledge of him, pray that it would overflow from your heart and that that would be seen and heard in your life as you are one who worships him. And then as you teach this to others, uh, be praying that they too would be stirred by God's word to live rightly in response to who he is. Well, again, one of the key strategies that I used in um, understanding this passage was to use what's called the narrative plot arc. So where we see the setting, conflict, climax, resolution, and then the new setting. In this section, our setting is given in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, where we will see that in the seventh month, we'll look a moment at the importance of that, all the people are gathering in Jerusalem. So the setting is given where in this holiest of months for God's people, they all gather together in Jerusalem as was prescribed by God's word. Then the conflict is seen in chapter 3, verse 2 to verse 9, um, as this united community seek to reestablish right worship of God um, at the temple with both um, sacrifice and and as we'll see, song. The climax I saw at verse, uh, from verse 10 to 11a. So in this little section here, uh, where we see this worshiping community now, they finish the foundations as prescribed in God's word, and then they begin to really worship God. So as this right knowledge of God has caused them to to build and worship in sacrifice. Now it's overflowing from their hearts and is heard as they sing, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. And then the resolution is seen in um, 3 verse, uh, sorry, 3 verse 11b to 13. So 11b to 13. And the worship is a mix of both rejoicing and lament in the restoration that's taking place. Um, they, they are rejoicing, shouting praise to the Lord, but also these older people we'll look at later are, are realizing this isn't quite it yet. Um, and, then, and then in the second part, 3 verse uh, 13, um, the phrase, the sound was heard far away cues us for chapter 4, where we see the opponents um, who no doubt heard this news start to, to make trouble for God's people. So the new setting is keying us in to chapter 4. This tool is just useful for us where you're getting to the climax of the story, which shows you the, the, the heart of what's going on here. And the climax shows us the fact that they are worshiping they are doing what is prescribed they're living according to the book they're all in this together and together they sing he is good his love endures forever so worship really is at the heart of this section but it's a worship uh, that starts from a right knowledge of god and that's why it's important for us to see that it keeps on repeating in accordance with what is written or as prescribed, or the appointed feasts, as prescribed. So here we have a community of God's people worshiping God, but it's flowing out of a right understanding of God through his word. 
and then that is overflowing from their hearts in both um, what is seen and then what is heard. We also see this repetition of together as one. We see here uh, the rest of the people, all who had returned, again all the people. So there's very much a together, they're all in this together. So the key to them worshipping is by having a right knowledge of God and being in this together. Uh, they help each other to keep going. And we see that they've all assembled as one in Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is the focus here. As we saw in the previous chapter, um, they had been sent home by Cyrus to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And now even though at the end of chapter 2, they had all settled in their own towns, here within the first year, we note their first year because verse 8 tells us in the second year, so this must be the seventh month of the first year. They all gather together in Jerusalem. So they've now left their towns. Um, they've left their homes that probably aren't properly established yet. Um, they've actually left them vulnerable because we've, we'll see in the next chapter that there are enemies who are making life really hard for them. So they aren't just leaving their homes in, uh, in comfort and in a good standing. They actually are taking a risk and going, but they clearly want to obey God's word and worship him rightly. And they know that the seventh month was a key month for them. Um, you can read more about this um, throughout, particularly in the books of Moses. Um, we're told about the Day of Atonement, um, which happens on the 10th day of the seventh month. So the Day of Atonement happened in that month. We are also told about the Festival of Tabernacles, um, which happened so the 10th day of the seventh month. This started on the 15th day. Um, you can read all about it in Numbers uh, 29, verse 12 to 38. Um, and this is a festival celebrating God's faithfulness. And they are doing all of this by the book. They know that this holy month, um, a month where um, they are rejoicing in God, but a key part of that month is sacrifice. And so they go back and build the altar. They build the altar on its foundation. So again, showing they want to do it by the book. And on this altar, what's the point of an altar? Well, it's to offer burnt sacrifices. And we see that also repeated here. Um, they're offering the prescribed, appointed sacrifices, the evening and morning sacrifices. So this first part, they are re-establishing sacrificial worship. Um, and the reason that offerings needed to be made the reason for the day of atonement is that atonement needed to be made their relationship with god had been broken because of sin and in order for them to be made you can remember this word at one at one with god again for their relationship to be fixed sacrifice needed to be made and so they offer these sacrifices in accordance with what is written, you can go and read Exodus 29, verse 38 to 42. Um, they are doing everything by the book. They want to get this right. We see here it says, despite their fear, and this could also be translated better, because of their fear. So it's not, it's more than just um despite their fear, in spite of their fear, but actually because of their fear, they seek to worship God um, because they, they want to show that they fear God more than they fear the people around them. They want to worship God rightly. Not only is it sacrificial worship on the altar, but also we see a focus on the foundation of the temple and the transition here into the next little part and the house of God. They now are building the the foundations of God's temple.
And again, we see Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, is a key player in the story. Um, remember from chapter 2, Zerubbabel is a direct descendant of King David. So the promise made to David stands. Uh, this is a, a foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus, who, who also came from the line of David. Zerubbabel is mentioned in his um, genealogy. And so they've got good leaders in Zerubbabel. They've got good spiritual leaders in Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Um, and all the priests and Levites who are there, making sure that they get this worship right. So they've got great leaders, spiritual leaders, um, in the line of their king leaders. But don't forget, they're all in this together. The rest of the people. It's not just the leaders, but the rest of the people. Everyone who's returned, all the people. Um, we see it again here because the people made so much noise. They're all in this together. And they're all seeking to worship God rightly. And what we see here is they are seeking to restore worship to God for what, it, what God had originally intended it to be. Um, and as we get to verse 7 onwards, uh, this sounds very much like Solomon's preparations to build the temple. Uh, you can read about those in 1 Kings 5 or 2 Chronicles 2. So they're seeking to build in the same way that Solomon had built. Um, also, when it says here yeah, in the second month of the second year, uh, the second month is the same month that Solomon had started building uh, the first temple. So they're trying to do this by the book. We've also got the Levite supervising, which is again trying to do it by the book. Um, that's how they had done it. Oopsie, 23. Verse 4, um, as prescribed, again, they're doing it by the book. So they're wanting to do things rightly. They're wanting to worship God as Moses had told them to do it. They're wanting to rebuild the temple, much like great King Solomon had built the temple. And then they're wanting to worship in the same way that King David and King Solomon had done. So we see here in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 34, we see them worshipping this way. But there's something bigger happening here. If you go and read Jeremiah 33 verse 10 to 11, um, we'll see that Jeremiah said many years before this happened, right at the beginning of the exile, Jeremiah prophesied that God would bring his people back and the sounds of joy would be heard again. And they would be singing, he is good, his love endures forever. So God is keeping his word as he promised to do. But now we do need to work out what's happening with this um, bat in verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads wept aloud. Um, so there's this mix of joy and weeping. And... It seems like these older guys had probably seen the previous temple. And as they see this foundation being laid, they realize this is not quite as good as what it could be. Um, and if you go and read Ezekiel's prophecies, you'll see Ezekiel had prophesied that the new temple would be even greater. And they're saying, this can't be it. Surely there's more. Now, later on, we'll hear about um, Haggai, the prophet, being with them, encouraging them. If you want to go and read Haggai 2, verse 2 to 9, you'll see that Haggai said that the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Now, he, it's another illusion pointing us ahead to our Lord Jesus when uh, John 1, verse 14 says, and we have seen his glory. And when Jesus walked into the temple, then the glory of this house was greater than Solomon's house. But that is pointing ahead these people weeping, longing for more, is actually a part of their worship. They want to worship God rightly and they're realizing they're not fully there yet. But a key thing that we do see in this whole section is that worship starts with a right knowledge of God, according to his word. 
And that knowledge of God then overflows from their hearts and is seen as they sacrifice, it's seen as they build the temple, and then it is heard as they sing, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. It's heard with this great shout, and the sound is heard far away. So the good news, their worship of God, is something that is ringing out from them, and others are hearing about it. And this is true for us. We aren't to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, but we're still called to build the temple as in God's people. And as we do that, we do it in response to God. As we grow to have a right knowledge of him, uh, our worship starts there. It overflows from our hearts and is both seen and heard. And so let's be praying that God would continue to stir our own hearts that our worship of him would be something that comes from the right place. It comes from hearts that are stirred by him as we respond rightly to him. Well, God bless as you dig in further.